Let's turn over then to Judges chapter 11. And we're going to read two sections of that uh, chapter. The first is 1 through 11, and then we'll move over to verse 29 and read through to the end of the chapter. So Judges 11, verses 1 through 11, and 29 through 40. Now Jephthah the Gileadite was a mighty man of valour, and he was a son of an harlot. And Gilead begat Jephthah, and Gilead's wife bare him sons. And his wife's sons grew up, and they thrust out Jephthah, and said unto him, Thou shalt not inherit in our father's house, for thou art the son of a strange woman. Then Jephthah fled from his brethren and dwelt in the land of Tob. And there were gathered vain men to Jephthah and went out with him. And it came to pass in process of time that the children of Ammon made war against Israel. And it was so that when the children of Ammon made war against Israel, the elders of Gilead went to fetch Jephthah out of the land of Tob. And they said unto Jephthah, Come, and be our captain, that we may fight with the children of Ammon. And Jephthah said unto the, unto the elders of Gilead, Did not ye hate me, and expel me out of my father's house? And why are ye come unto me now, when ye are in distress? And the elders of Gilead said unto Jephthah, Therefore we turn again to thee now, that thou mayest go with us, and fight against the children of Ammon, and be our head over all the inhabitants of Gilead. And Jephthah said unto the elders of Gilead, If ye bring me home again to fight against the children of Ammon, and the Lord deliver them before me, shall I be your head? And the elders of Gilead said unto Jephthah, The Lord be witness between us, if we do not so according to thy words. Then Jephthah went with the elders of Gilead, and the people made him head and captain over them. And Jephthah uttered all his words, all his words before the Lord in Mizpah. Now over to verse 29. When the Spirit of the Lord came upon Jephthah, and he passed over Gilead and Manasseh and passed over Mizpah of Gilead, and from Mizpah of Gilead he passed over unto the children of Ammon. And Jephthah vowed a bow unto the Lord and said, If thou shalt without fail deliver the children of Ammon into mine hands, then it shall be that whatsoever cometh forth of the doors of my house to meet me when I return in peace from the children of Ammon shall surely be the Lord's, and I will offer it up for a burnt offering. So Jephthah passed over unto the children of Ammon to fight against them, and the Lord delivered them into his hands. And he smote them from Aurora, even till thou come to Minneth, even twenty cities, and unto the plain of the vineyard with a very great slaughter. Thus the children of Ammon were subdued before the children of Israel. And Jephthah came to Mizpah unto his house, and behold, his daughter came out to meet him with timbrels and with dances, and she was his only child. Beside her... He had neither son nor daughter. And it came to pass when he saw her that he rent his clothes and said, Alas, my daughter, thou hast brought me very low, and thou art one of them that trouble me. For I have opened my mouth unto the Lord, and I cannot go back. And she said unto him, My father, if thou hast opened thy mouth unto the Lord, do to me according to that which hath proceeded out of thy mouth, for as much as the Lord hath taken vengeance for thee of thine enemies, even of the children of Ammon. And she said unto her father, Let this thing be done for me. Let me alone two months, that I may go up and down upon the mountains, and bewail my virginity, I and my fellows. And he said, Go. And he sent her away for two months, and she went with her companions, and bewailed her virginity upon the mountains. And it came to pass at the end of two months that she returned unto her father who did with her according to his vow which he had vowed and she knew no man and it was a custom in Israel that the daughters of Israel 
went yearly to lament the daughter of Jephthah, the Gileadite, four days in a year. May the Lord bless to us his own word, uh, and particularly as we come to uh, take up a portion of those uh, that reading in our sermon. The sermon this morning, brethren, is uh, Judges chapter 11, uh, 29 through 31, and then 34 through 40. And given the length of the passage, we won't be reading that again now. But you might like to have the, uh, your Bible open at those sections. Judges 11 then. Here we're introduced uh, to Jephthah. Uh, Jephthah was the eighth judge of Israel. And the thing for which he is often remembered was the vow that he made unto the Lord shortly prior to leading uh, the Gileadites into battle against the Ammonites. Uh, Jephthah's rash or foolish vow is how that view, how that vow rather, is often characterised. Uh, however, the characterisation of Jephthah's vow as rash or foolish uh, does not sit altogether well with the fact that there was no more honourable, no more God-fearing judge in Israel than Jephthah. While other judges may have performed more notable feats and been instrumental in more important victories, the service rendered by Jephthah in leading the children of Israel to victory over the Ammonites should not be minimised. Furthermore, the testimony of Scripture is that Jephthah was an outstanding man of God. He was a man in whose heart the Lord had worked by his spirit. The writer to the Hebrews testifies of that fact in Hebrews 11 in the verses 32 through 34. And there the writer of the Hebrews pens this. And what shall I more say? For the time would fail to tell me of Gideon and of Barak and of Samson and of Jephthah. Then he goes on to describe what those men had done, who through faith subdued kingdoms, wrought righteousness, obtained promises, stopped the mouths of lion, quenched the violence of fire, escaped the edge of the sword, out of weakness were made strong, waxed valiant in fight, turned to flight the armies of the aliens. Uh, Jephthah loved God. And Jephthah's love for and devotion to God was evidenced by his conduct. Uh, though treated shamefully by his own family and as a result deprived of his inheritance, nonetheless Jephthah responded to the call of the elders of Israel in their time of need. And furthermore, when confronted with the personal implications of his vow made to the Lord, Jephthah did not resile from those things which he had promised. Jephthah was a man of God. He was a man of faith and he was a man of integrity. Having made promises and vows unto the Lord, notwithstanding the costly implications for himself, Jephthah kept his word. He honoured his vow. For I have opened my mouth unto the Lord, said Jephthah, and I cannot go back. For the vows are part of the Christian life. Uh, we make vows. We make vows uh, when we baptise, uh, for example, our children. Uh, we make vows when we marry. We make vows when we become communicant members of the church. We make vows when we take up office in the church. And so the words of Jephthah should actually resonate with us. With Jephthah, we should also say, for 
For I have opened my mouth unto the Lord and I cannot go back. I look at this word of God this morning under this theme, Jephthah, a man of integrity. <clears throat> look firstly at, at the godly vow, secondly at the personal cost and finally at the enduring legacy. <clears throat> In the background of this passage of the word of God uh, is this. Now, the children of Israel, and particularly those uh, who belong to the tribe of Gilead, uh, have been enduring constant incursions uh, from the Ammonites uh, who dwelt on the eastern side of the Jordan River. Now, the Gileadites uh, also dwelt both on the west and the eastern side of the Jordan and what was occurring was that uh, the Ammonites, uh, who occupied territory nearby, uh, would regularly make incursions, particularly into the land of Gilead on the eastern uh, side of the Jordan. The Ammonites, of course, were the inveterate enemies of the people of God. The Ammonites, the Ammonites were descendants of Ammon, one of the, uh, Lot, the sons of Lot, born as a result of Lot's incestuous relationship with his youngest daughter. And throughout their history, the Ammonites uh, had opposed the children of Israel. You might even recall that prior to the period of the judges, the Ammonites, along with the Moabites, conspired with Balaam to curse the children of Israel as they're about to enter into the Promised Land. And so the Ammonites that occupied a tract of land uh, to the east of the Jordan and north of the Dead Sea uh, continually raided the land of Israel and particularly the territory occupied uh, by uh, Gilead. Indeed, if you were to go back into Judges chapter 10, uh, you would uh, see how that for some 18 years uh, the Ammonites had been oppressing uh, the children of Gilead, and they'd done that by making repeated raids into the territory of the children of Israel. Now, as these repeated incursions into the territory uh, that uh, led the elders of Gilead to seek the assistance of Jephthah. Uh, Jephthah, as we read in Judges 11, uh, was a son of Gilead, uh, uh, but he was an illegitimate son. In other words, his mother was a prostitute. And being an illegitimate son, Jephthah had been forced by his stepbrothers to leave his homeland and to forfeit his father's inheritance. Driven out of Gilead, Jephthah had taken up residence in the land of Tob. And Tob lay to the north, to the north of Gilead. And there in the land of Tob, uh, Jephthah had become a successful leader uh, of a Bedouin-like company of men. Uh, his fame as a leader of men was what led the elders of Gilead to seek his assistance in their ongoing struggles with the Ammonites. Notwithstanding how he had been treated uh, by his brethren, Jephthah responded positively to the call of the elders of Gilead to return and to lead the Gileadites in war against the Ammonites. We find that on his return to Gilead, Jephthah initially seeks to avoid open conflict with the king of Ammon, but to know, uh, with no success. Indeed, it became very uh, evident very early on that the king of Ammon was intent on driving the Gileadites out of the eastern side of the Jordan River and taking possession of that land, land for himself. And so as a result, we find in verse 29 that we're informed that the spirit of the Lord came upon Jephthah and he passed over unto the children of Ammon. In other words, uh, the Spirit of the Lord came upon Jephthah and he began to engage the children of Ammon 
in war. It was in preparation for his conflict with the Ammonites that Jephthah vowed a vow unto the Lord. That's uh, verse 30 of chapter 11. The content of his vow to the Lord is recorded in verses 30 and 31. And this was the vow. He says to the Lord, If thou shalt without fail deliver the children of Ammon into my hands, then it shall be that whatsoever comes forth of the doors of my house to meet me when I return in peace from the children of Ammon shall surely be the Lord's, and I will offer it up for a burnt offering. Now many commentators uh, consider this vow by Jephthah, uh, as I mentioned in the introduction, to have been rash and foolish. It's contended that Jephthah should never have entered into uh, such a vow. His vow is said to have been hastily made with little consideration of the possible outcomes. And as a result, his vow led to severe and unintended consequences, both for himself and for his daughter. And so with that understanding, many commentators suggest that this event is recorded in Scripture uh, as a warning against the making of rash or ill-considered vows. And those who adopt that view, uh, though acknowledging Jephthah to be a godly man, uh, contend that he seriously erred in making such a vow. However, such an analysis of Jephthah and his vow uh, does him, in my estimation, a gross injustice. There are a number of things that need to be noted if we are to rightly evaluate Jephthah's vow. Firstly, Jephthah made his vow, uh, you will note, immediately after the Spirit of the Lord came upon him. Indeed, the vow forms part of Jephthah's prayer in which, empowered by the Spirit of God, he confidently seeks the Lord's assistance and expresses confidence that the Lord would give him the victory over the Ammonites. Rather than being rash, Jephthah's vow was born of the Spirit of God and was an expression of his absolute confidence in and his dependence upon the Lord. Secondly, it should also be appreciated that when Jephthah made his vow, he actually had a human being in mind and not an animal. It's often suggested that the fact that his daughter came out to greet him on his return uh, was something that uh, Jephthah never contemplated in that uh, he consequently was then obliged uh, to sacrifice uh, a member of his own household, uh, whereas it suggests that he, he had only ever contemplated uh, sacrificing an animal uh, unto the Lord. And many commentators indeed suggest that Jephthah simply had an animal in mind in his vow, but to his surprise and dismay, it was his daughter and not an animal uh, that met him upon his return. Uh, in some ways, that's the impression that the King James translation uh, itself gives of Jephthah's vow. <clears throat> you read there in verses 30, 31, If thou shalt without fail deliver the children of Ammon into mine hands, then it shall be that whatsoever cometh forth of the doors of my house to meet me, uh, shall surely be the Lord's. Um, and that word whatsoever uh, suggests uh, that what Je Jephthah was contemplating uh, was an animal as opposed uh, to a human being. Uh, however, it should be noted that the Hebrew word translated whatsoever uh, could just as properly also be translated whosoever. Uh, likewise, the reference to it, which is also suggestive of an animal, could just as correctly be translated him 
or her. It's a mistake to think that Jephthah made his vow uh, simply with a view to an animal being offered as a burnt offering upon his return. In fact, when Jephthah made his vow, uh, he actually did have in mind a member of his own household. Uh, Now, undoubtedly, uh, Jephthah was surprised and dismayed when it was his daughter that came out first to greet him. But it should not be thought that he was in—he was not anticipating that his vow involved uh, the offering up of a human being uh, into the service of the Lord. But Jephthah was contemplating a human being at the time that he made his vow is actually evident from the vow itself. <clears throat> Notice in verse 31, he says, Then it shall be uh, that whatsoever or whosoever cometh forth of the doors of my house to meet me shall surely be the Lord's. Uh, The words translated there, meet me, arise from a Hebrew verb that means literally to call upon or to greet. Uh, It cannot be reasonably suggested that when Jephthah made his vow to the Lord that he was contemplating that a sheep or a goat or a bull would emerge from the doors of his house to greet him or to meet him. Now, when Jephthah made his vow, uh, he was contemplating that a valued member of his household would come forth to meet or greet him upon his return. The third thing about Jephthah's vow that needs to also be appreciated is that the essence of the vow that Jephthah made uh, was to consecrate or dedicate the one who first came forth to meet him to the Lord. This was the overriding uh, intent of Jephthah's promise appears also from what he vowed. Uh, Whatsoever shall come forth of the doors of my house to meet me when I return in peace from the children of Ammon shall surely shall surely be the Lord's. This was Jephthah's primary intent, that is, that the one coming to meet him would be dedicated to the Lord. In other words, that one would belong to the Lord. But what's to be understood then by the additional statement, and I will offer him or her up for a burnt offering? Was Jephthah contemplating offering up a human being as a burnt offering? The answer to that, of course, is no. Such conduct belonged to the pagan nations around the children of Israel, but not to the children of Israel themselves. Human sacrifices were an abomination unto the Lord. And Jephthah was a man that feared God. He was a man in whom the Spirit of God dwelt. And therefore, to suggest that Jephthah was contemplating offering up a human being as a burnt offering does not accord with what we know of Jephthah. To grasp what Jephthah intended uh, when he spoke of offering him or her up as a burnt offering is actually helpful to consider uh, what a burnt offering actually signified. The burnt offering, unlike all other forms of sacrifice, involved the whole of the body of the animal sacrificed being consumed by fire. And there were two aspects or two things signified uh, by the action of the consuming of the whole animal uh, by fire. Firstly, the burnt offering uh, was designed to depict an expiatory sacrifice, that is, an atoning sacrifice. The victim dying for the sin of the one who brought the offering. So that was that's one aspect of the burnt offering. It should also be noted that though that was one aspect of the burnt offering, it was not the primary aspect or the primary thing set forth by the burnt offering. The primary purpose of the burnt offering 
was as a self-dedicatory sacrifice. The entire sacrifice being consumed, the burnt offering symbolising and picturing the complete consecration or dedication of the one bringing the offering to the Lord. In bringing a burnt offering, the one bringing the offering was declaring their willingness to dedicate their life to the Lord. The bringing of a burnt offering was really a statement of intent. By it, the offerer declared that he would devote himself wholeheartedly to the service of the Lord. And that is what Jephthah intended when he vowed that he would offer the one that came forth first to greet him for a burnt offering. Jephthah's vow concerned concerned the offering of that member of his household as a symbol of his complete consecration and dedication to the Lord. In other words, Jephthah was willing to sacrifice uh, and to give up a valued member of his household as a symbol of his own complete consecration and dedication to the Lord. Jephthah's vow viewed against those things was not rash, nor was it foolish. Much less did it have its origins in pagan rites and ceremonies that contemplated the offering up of a human sacrifice. Jephthah's vow was a godly vow. His vow was an expression of his dedication and thankfulness to the Lord. And it was grounded in the sure knowledge that the Lord would give the children of Gilead the victory over the Ammonites. Indeed, even before Jephthah entered into battle with the Ammonites, he knew that the Lord would actually give him the victory. He was assured that the Lord would give him the victory. He knew that because not only had the elders of Gilead called him to be their captain, but the Lord had also called him by his spirit to lead the children of Gilead. Jephthah's appointment as the leader of Gilead was according to the appointment of the Spirit of God. We're told there in verse 29, and the Spirit of the Lord came upon Jephthah. And the Spirit of the Lord came upon Jephthah not to perform a work of grace in his heart. Now Jephthah was already a child of God. But the Spirit of the Lord came upon him at that time to qualify and to equip him to be the deliverer of the children of Gilead. Jephthah's conviction and confidence uh, is reflected in his vow. That's what he says there in the vow again. Verse 31, Then shall it be that whosoever cometh forth of the doors of my house to meet me, when I return in peace, when I return in peace from the children of Ammon, then it shall be, at that time, at the time of his return, you see, there's no question in Jephthah's mind that he would actually return from his warfare with the children of Ammon, that he'd actually return in peace. He'd return under the blessing of God. He would return victorious. He says, when I return in peace, not if I return in peace. Victory over the Ammonites was assured in Jephthah's mind. And therefore, as an expression of his gratitude to the Lord, Jephthah promised to surrender to the Lord something that was precious to him, to him, a member of his own household. I think you could say this, that the substance of Jephthah's vow was this, Lord, if you will deliver Ammon into my hands, as I know you will, then it is fitting that I should show my thankfulness for such a great victory. 
and I will express my thankfulness by dedicating to you whoever comes forth first from my house to greet me upon my return. Jephthah, of course, is not the only one that makes vows or has made vows. Rather, many of us have made vows. We've made promises unto the Lord. Uh, we did that at the time we became communicant members of the church. Uh, at that time, we vowed uh, to submit in the Lord to all scriptural teaching, discipline and government in the church. Furthermore, we vowed to recognise our responsibility to work with others in the church and to support and encourage them in their service of the Lord. Uh, furthermore, we at that time also vowed to diligently read the Bible to engage in private prayer, to keep the Lord's Day, to regularly attend the worship services, to aim by God's grace and the power of his Holy Spirit to seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. And we uh, promise to do that in all the parts of our daily life and to faithfully perform our whole duty as true servants of our Saviour. Uh, they're all part of the vows that we actually have made at the time we became members of the church. We do well to remember the words of Jephthah. We have opened our mouths unto the Lord. Many of us have also made vows to the Lord uh, with respect to marriage. We made vows not only to our husbands and to our wives, we've also made vows unto the Lord. As husbands, we are promised to be loving and faithful husbands unto our wives. And we've been pro we've promised to be that until God should separate us by death. As wives, we've promised to be loving, faithful and obedient wives unto our husbands. And we also have promised to do that until God shall separate us by death. We have opened our mouths unto the Lord. Some of us have made vows with respect uh, to our children on the occasion of their baptisms. On, those, on that occasion, we vowed before the Lord to raise our children in the nurture and the admonition of the Lord. We've also promised to do our utmost to lead our children to a sound knowledge of Jesus Christ beginning in their earliest years. And furthermore, we promised to pray with and for our sons or daughters and to live before them as Christian parents. Again, we have opened our mouths unto the Lord. Some of us also have made vows as office bearers in the church. And we have vowed uh, to own and believe the whole doctrine uh, contained in the Westminster Confession of Faith. Furthermore, we vowed to defend the doctrine, worship, discipline and government of this church. And furthermore, we have promised to faithfully, diligently and cheerfully discharge the duties of our office. And we moreover have also vowed to shepherd and to care for the flock of God over which he's placed us. So, brethren, brethren, again, as as office bearers in the church, we have actually opened our mouths unto the Lord. The Lord gave Jephthah an astounding victory 
over the Ammonites. News of the victory preceded his return. To Jephthah's surprise and to his dismay, the first person to greet him upon his return was none other than his daughter. And to highlight the significance of that, our text emphasises that she was his only daughter. Indeed, it emphasises that she was his only child. Verse 34, And Jephthah came to Mizpah unto his house, and behold, his daughter came out to meet him with timbrels and with dances, and she was his only child. Beside her he had neither son nor daughter. That evidence is to us that without doubt his daughter would have been extremely precious uh, to him. And that's reflected in what we read also in verse 35 because when he saw her, when he saw his daughter as the first one to come to greet him, uh, the implications of his vow immediately struck home to Jephthah. We read there in verse 35, and it came to pass when he saw her that he rent his clothes and said, Alas, my daughter, thou hast brought me very low, and thou art one of them that trouble me, for I have opened my mouth unto the Lord, and I cannot go back. Something that Jephthah had never uh, apparently contemplated came to pass. He had not contemplated that it might be his daughter that would first come to greet him upon his return. And he's now confronted with the vow that he's made and the implication of that vow for himself and for his daughter. Perhaps Jephthah's uh, natural inclination and perhaps it's an inclination that we're also uh, inclined to follow. Perhaps Jephthah's natural inclination would have been to set aside his vow, not to acknowledge that vow, not to fulfil that vow, But such was Jephthah's personal devotion to the Lord that Jephthah would not resile from his vow. He says, I have opened my, vow, my mouth unto the Lord. I have vowed unto the Lord. It vowed a vow to God to the God of his salvation. And when he contemplated and considered that fact, Jephthah says to his daughter, I have opened my mouth unto the Lord and I cannot go back. I cannot go back. No, Jephthah does not say, uh, I may not go back, nor does he say, I will not go back, but he says, I cannot go back. For Jephthah, it was unthinkable that he should step back from the vow that he'd actually made to the Lord. Uh, so high did he view the Lord. Jephthah was a man of his word. He would keep the vow that he made, notwithstanding the implications that that vow now had for him. 
Contrary to what some commentators maintain, uh, though Jephthah was a man of his word, one ought not to think that he intended offering up his daughter as a physical sacrifice upon an altar. Uh, Jephthah was not a pagan and to have offered up his daughter in that way uh, would have been an abomination uh, to the Lord. Rather, Jephthah committed to doing what he had always intended to do. He dedicated his daughter, notwithstanding that she was his only daughter and indeed only child, he dedicated his daughter to the Lord. Committing his daughter to a lifetime of celibacy and service of the Lord. And the implication of what Jephthah intended to do was this. Jephthah's daughter would never marry and nor would she ever have a family nor would she ever bear children. This is what Jephthah's sacrifice of his daughter involved. It's actually indicated in verse 37 when his daughter says to him, let me bewail my virginity. Let, let me bewail uh, the fact that I will never e enter into an intimate relationship uh, with a man. It's borne out also in verse 39 where it's recorded, and she knew no man. The life of Jephthah's daughter uh, was sacrificed and dedicated to the Lord, not the physical life of Jephthah's daughter, but the life that she could live in this world was dedicated to the Lord. The personal cost to Jephthah himself was enormous. Uh, after all, his daughter was his only child. It would appear, in fact, that Jephthah's daughter was relatively young and not yet uh, married. And so her life actually stretched out before her and the expectation, the expectations perhaps of marriage, of children, of family, uh, all lay before her. For Jephthah, the personal cost of honouring this vow uh, meant the effective loss of his daughter. It also meant that we'd have no grandchildren Jephthah's daughter was his only family. And if uh, she was to be dedicated in the way that he envisaged the Lord, she would not marry, she would not have children. And so Jephthah's name and his place among the children of Israel would eventually be extinguished. Hence his cry in verse 35, Alas, my daughter, thou hast brought me very low, and thou art one of them that trouble me. But notwithstanding the enormous personal cost, uh, both to himself and to his daughter, Jephthah maintained, maintained his vow. I have opened my mouth unto the Lord, and I cannot go back. Brethren, the keeping of vows that we've made at times can prove to be very costly, uh, perhaps more costly than we had ever anticipated. When we made vows, for example, of our profession of faith, and of our willingness to give our lives to the service of Jesus Christ. At times that can uh, require far more of us than we might ever contemplate or think at the time we made 
that vow. The question remains, will we remain faithful to that vow? Or will we step back? Will we turn, are we willing to turn our backs on the pleasures of this world? Are we to, willing to forsake ungodly friendships? Are we willing to forego the opportunities at times that the world presents to us? Think of the implications of this also for our marriages. Uh, Husbands, we vow uh, to love our wives. Indeed, we vow to love our wives even as Christ loved the church and gave himself for it. Uh, Now that at times might prove to be a much more onerous vow than we might ever have contemplated. But will we seek to honour that vow? Similarly for wives, uh, will we seek to honour the vows that we have made uh, when we marry? Likewise, baptismal vows. Uh, when we uh, bring our babies uh, and children for baptism, we, we make serious promises to the Lord. Uh, promises, in fact, that perhaps we don't even begin to contemplate just how much energy and effort and time and resources that will require. The, uh, the time spent instructing, teaching, encouraging our children in the ways of the Lord. Day after day, week after week, year after year. And likewise, for those of us who hold office in the church, uh, we promise uh, to uphold the standards of our church. We promise to fulfil uh, the role of uh, sh- under-shepherds uh, in the Church of Jesus Christ to care for the flock, to nurture the flock, to protect the flock. At times the going in that respect becomes difficult. But we, will we also say, I have opened my mouth unto the Lord and I cannot go back. I think this is particularly significant, brethren, for us at the present time as in the, in the not too distant future we're going to be calling again for nominations uh, for the office of elder in the congregation. Uh, and here we have laid out before us uh, not necessarily the, the detailed requirements of an officer or an office bearer in the church Uh, But this is the nature and the quality of the man or the men that we should seek. Uh, We should seek men who honour their vows and who will honour their vows and who will acknowledge that they've opened their mouths unto the Lord and they will not step back from the vows that they've made. Brethren, in the Christian life, uh, there is a cost. Cost in many areas of our life to the vows that we make. Our calling as Christians, as those in whom the Spirit of God, the Spirit of Christ dwells, is actually to be faithful to the Lord, faithful to our promises, faithful to to our vows. We are to be men and women of genuine integrity. We are to be known as those who actually keep and honour our word. Though the personal cost to Jephthah was high, all was actually not lost for him. Because the Lord actually gave to him a precious reward and an enduring legacy. His reward was that his name, though he would actually have no grandchildren, his reward was that his name 
would not be lost among the children of Israel. Indeed, his name would not be lost among the church of God in all ages. He lost his physical inheritance in the land of Canaan and he would have no children that would carry on his name among the children of Israel. But Jephthah was a man who had a spiritual inheritance in the heavenly Canaan. And his name uh, is remembered. It's remembered from generation to generation. And his name is remembered because in Hebrews 11, he's recorded as one of the outstanding saints in the Old Testament scriptures. And so his name and his place among the people of God endures to this day. There have been many, many uh, of God's people uh, throughout the history of this world uh, whose names have uh, now proceeded into uh, history. Uh, but the name of Jephthah remains before the church of God even to this day. The church of God remembers Jephthah. We remember Jephthah. We know who Jephthah was. We know of the integrity of Jephthah. His place among the people of God is forever assured. We know that Jephthah was a man of faith, a man of integrity, a man who honoured his word, a man who kept his vow. And Jephthah also received an enduring legacy through his daughter. We find that in verses 39 and 40. There was a custom in Israel that the daughters of Israel went yearly to lament the daughter of Jephthah the Gileadite four days in a year. Uh, we might think Jephthah was an outstanding man. Uh, Jephthah's daughter was an outstanding woman. It was not her vow. It was Jephthah's vow, a vow made by her father. And that vow made by her father had life-changing implications for her. We might say that the vow that Jephthah made was costly to himself. But when you think about it, it was even more costly for his daughter. It cost her the opportunity to marry, to have children, to have a family, to live an ordinary life. It cost her, in essence, her freedom. Yet so outstanding was Jephthah's daughter that she willingly submitted to what her father had promised. Verse 36. My father, if thou hast opened thy mouth unto the Lord, do to me according to that which hath proceeded out of thy mouth. For as much as the Lord hath taken vengeance for thee of thine enemies, even of the children of Ammon. Now that is truly outstanding. As a result of his vow, for four days every year, the daughters of Israel, uh, we're told, went to lament the daughter of Jephthah. That's the uh, verses 39 and 40. It came to pass at the end of two months that she returned unto her father. This is after she asked for a period of time. Uh, and so she came, returned unto her father, who did, we are told, according to his vow, which he had vowed, and she knew no man. 
And then we read, And it was a custom in Israel that the daughters of Israel went yearly to lament the daughter of Jephthah, the Gileadite, four days in a year. They went not to lament her death, but they went to honour and celebrate her faithfulness to the Lord. Uh, the word translated in the KJV, lament, uh, could perhaps better be translated praise or celebrate. The daughters of Gilead celebrated the life of the daughter of Jephthah four days in every year. Love and devotion to the Lord was the hallmark of Jephthah's family. Father and daughter were of one spiritual mind and both willingly sacrificed their lives and their earthly happiness in order that they might actually serve the Lord and that the promises made by Jephthah to the Lord might be fulfilled. Rather than the Church of Jesus Christ and need such men and women today. We as a congregation need men and women of the calibre of Jephthah and his daughter. Men and women who honour God above their own interests and who are men and women of integrity. Amen.